Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums in the Co-Captain's Chair. One of the many guest stars and big stars on the Hudson Valley Square is Mr. Ryan Scow. What's happening, my friend? Hey, good night, Pete. Today, we are uh, going to be tackling a band that uh, both of us like quite a bit. They're a band that there may be some of you out there who don't know, and if you don't, you should. Uh, but they have a really kind of cool underground following uh, that they've had for quite a long time. And I think they're a really cool band that does, uh, or I should say did, right? A lot of really cool things really well. We're talking about Manila Road from uh, from Kansas, right? I mean, the, the whole place. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a band started, founded, led by uh, Mark the Shark Shelton. May he rest in peace. So we lost him a couple of years back. A really interesting group that almost kind of, I mean, they're a metal band for sure, but it's almost like they have their own kind of sound, right? I mean, they're not. They're yeah, not they, really, kind of, they kind of like uh, developed like the epic metal sound that a couple of US bands had like Omen, Brokus Helm, but they were one of the first, in my opinion, they did it the best, all of them. But their earliest stuff, like going back to the 70s, they started in kind of like more of a, 70s psychedelic sound like 78 79 when they first kicked off so uh yeah, interesting trajectory they had yeah yeah i think those first couple albums are kind of like almost like a heavier hawk wind almost right kind of like kind of like space rock a little bit yeah that's actually a good comparison yeah very spacey the first two yeah very right spacey back. and then uh like all throughout the 80s i mean some really inventive different sounding albums that like you mentioned that epic heavy metal style there's certainly some thrash throughout their catalog. They dabbled a little bit, just a little bit in death metal along the way with different kind of vocal styles. Um, some really progressive arrangements at times, some doom elements yeah. here and there. I mean, they kind of did it all, right? Yep, phenomenal guitar playing. Mark was the guitarist and vocalist the whole time. And that man was an underrated, phenomenal guitarist. His leads throughout their entire career are just amazing. You know, he did the master those long kind of progressive guitar solos early on later on really really phenomenal guitars yeah yeah really really good player uh, a guy who knew how to write a catchy heavy riff for sure mm -hmm. uh you know i think for a lot of people and myself early on his vocal style is takes a little getting used to it's definitely different and unique right, right. it's a little nasally it is different it's yeah. definitely uh yeah the first time you hear him, it's just one of it's like it's like a Sierra Thungol, you know, kind of a similar deal. That's like another good comparison. You yeah. hear those vocals, even King Diamond. The first time you hear King Diamond, you're like, oh, you know, it's very polarizing. I guess is a good word for it. You either like it, love it, or like, eh, I don't know about this. Yeah. But I think most people over time they kind of grow into it. So and that's very the thing. Yeah, I think once I got real, you know, because I the music is totally up my alley, and mm -hmm. I think the first like because I went uh, when I first started dabbling in these guys as I always tend to do is I bought a, a handful of albums. I just, you know, I got a bunch of CDs. I'm like, all right, kind of like what I heard. I'm not crazy about the vocals, but the music is great. I'm just going to buy a bunch of their CDs. And I did. And then, you know, you start to listen to him and all of a sudden, you know, you kind of get used to it. Uh, but at first, yeah, it's a little polarizing. It's like a love hate thing at first, uh, but he definitely doesn't sound like anybody else, which I think is kind of cool. Absolutely. So uh, this catalog has a lot of albums. So what we decided to do is pick our 10 favorites each. And uh, I thought this was going to be a little easier than it was. This is, was really difficult because I don't think this band has ever released a dud. And quite a few of them are like really good, like really mm -hmm. good to the point where my list changed like five times over the last 48 hours because I was like, you know what? I think I like this one a little bit better than that one. Oh man, I can't put this one there. It's gotta be up to end. And there's like the movers and shakers all throughout mm -hmm. my list. And then I looked at like what I left off and I'm like, oh man, this is some really good stuff that doesn't, doesn't even make the cut, right? But uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. They, they don't think they have any duds and they're, they're one of my favorite bands. So that's one of the bands where I can't pinpoint, well, the, first, the number one album, which we'll get to eventually, I think I was that was a shoe in for me, but everything else it's like, and they got a whole slew of great albums in a row where I could easily like move them around and uh, be just as happy with any iteration in that list. So yeah, this was difficult to put together. Yeah, it definitely was. So I'm curious to see how your configuration is. So why don't you kick us off with your number 10? All right, number 10, this is from uh, 1990. This is the Court of Chaos album. 
And this is the final album from their kind of initial run. You know, obviously the 90s wasn't the kindest to bands like this, you know, like kind of traditional progressive heavy metal bands of like the old school, which these guys are certainly a part of. So the Court of Chaos was kind of a, uh, it was like a last two raw. They did another album two years later called Circus Maximus, which was supposed to be a uh, Mark Shelton solo album, but kind of like Seven Seal, uh, uh, Seven Star, sorry by Black Sabbath, uh, you know, it's like the record label, like, nah, we want to put the Manila Road name on this to uh, sell more copies. So they did that. But this was the last, like, intentional uh, Manila Road album for over a decade. So this is a, this is a good album. It's very uh, kind of a summation of where their career was. You know, it's got the classic, great, you know, fantasy art. And uh, it's a little slower because they, like, we're going to get into it. They got really in the thrash later on in the 80s. And this one kind of, like, slows it back down. So it's a good introspective of where they were. And uh, this is also the last album with the members that they had through most of the 80s, uh, Scott Park on bass and Randy Fox on drums. So a uh, solid album. Uh, you know, they never released the dud, like you said. So, you know, I'm coming in at number 10 for this. Uh, this is a very, very good album. And if I had to pick one song, it'd be the Book of Skelos, because they were amazing at writing these intense, long, epic tracks. And that is one of many that we'll uh, no doubt discuss. That's my number 10 choice. Yeah, that's a great track, a great album, and we'll talk more about that a little later on. Um, so my number 10, again, this was hard. Uh, I, I had like two of them that were like vying for my number 10 position. I said, all right, I'm going to go with one over the other. And I felt really bad. I left this other one off, but I'm like, you know, you got to do it, right? You got to got to take a stand at some point. So I'm going to go with the 2011's Playground of the Damned. So you can get a cool... Let me take this out of the uh, their album covers for the most part are pretty damn cool. Also, I think I yeah, should say that. that. Yeah. So there we go. Without the glare, um, got like this kind of cool, like kind of alien creature sort of. I guess there, right? A lot of good artwork on these albums. Uh, this is a very strong latter period album from them. I always kind of dug it. It's got uh, you know a little bit of everything that this band does so well. It's got the thrashier stuff. It's got the slower, you know, more epic pieces. Uh, Into the Maelstrom, great song. Title track kicks ass. Uh, I do, I do got to say, um, Corey Christner, the drummer during this period, fucking great. He was. He was really good. Really busy drumming i mean a lot of the drumming on some of these albums is very thrash oriented whereas even at times where mark isn't doing like your prototypical thrash riffs the drumming is like so acrobatic and tight um and i think that's what kind of a lot of times brings that the kind of thrash element in uh grindhouse terrific song um you got uh man probably my favorite song on this album is uh abattoir de la mort that's my favorite on that one. Oh. God, it's complex as all hell. The guitar work is just off the charts. A really, really solid record. You know, where uh, my guess is Ryan and I are going to lean pretty heavily on the early batch of albums in this list. But if you want to go check out one of the more recent albums that, in my opinion, might be one of their best of the, you know, the latter stages, uh, can't go wrong with this one. I dig it quite a bit. Good choice. So my number nine is uh, also a new album. And, uh, this is one of those bands. I'll just this album is uh, from 2005. It's called Gates of Fire. This is one of those bands. Uh, they always kind of had an obscure sound, like you said, always a little weird. And when they went later on, when they reunited and uh, started putting out albums again in 2001, none of these albums are, are like they're it's catchy songs, but it's not like snappy, like immediate stuff. Very long tracks. Uh, they always produced the stuff themselves, so it always had kind of that lo-fi like homebrew. Oh, big time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which I love. I always like that sound, you know. Uh, but it's not like really polished, like super, like, you know, clicky drums, none of that. Everything's very organic. It's like you're watching them in a rehearsal room. And uh, this, all their new albums had that. Uh, I don't know if Mark produced everything himself, but uh, I know he had a hand in the production. So 2005's Gates of Fire, this could have been maybe their most epic album. It has three long suites of songs, each consisting of several tracks. I had to uh, look up the first couple. Uh, the Frost Giant's Daughter, obviously written about Robert E. Howard, you know, perfect subject material. Uh, the second couple tracks are based on Virgil's The Ennead, and the last couple tracks are based on uh, King Leonidas, 300, The Spartans, everyone knows that. And the songs really match the, uh, the epic, you know, intentions of those very, very, you know, grandiose, uh, you know, subject matters here. If I had to pick one song, the opening track, Riddle of Steel, which obviously anybody that's seen Conan the Barbarian, you know where that's from. So, and that's just a freaking heavy, intense, you know, very epic, very song. song. 
some of these tracks are over 10 minutes long, uh, you know, which it's tough to write a song that's 10 minutes long, you know, and keep it interesting. They were able to do it uh, several times throughout their career. You know, the earlier stuff has epic tracks, but they really, I'm going to say kind of like Iron Maiden too, in their later career, they really started to lean heavily on that stuff. And I know, you know, much like Maiden, you know, some people are like, oh, God, can't they write just like an Aces High all the time? But I like that longer stuff that they did later on. You know, I know, you know, as it's, you know, when, you know, people like it and don't like it, but uh, Manila Road, much more obscure, but I thought they really did that well too. These really long, aggressive, you know, epic songs that fit the subject matter. So I'm going with uh, Gates of Fire from 2005. That's got some cool artwork too. It has the three flames and each of the flames inside has like the little, uh, of the three stories contained within. So good stuff. Yeah. Great artwork on all these albums. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fan. I'm more about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go number nine to 2008 Voyager. Um, yeah. Again, it, you know, with, with these, uh, with this album art, you got to see it without the glare, right? Pretty cool. So again, you know, they are kind of going down that, uh, that road of that uh, epic fantasy sword and sorcery barbarian type of uh, lyrical content which uh, i think is pretty cool kind of suits their music um a lot of really strong tunes on this one again and, and you know one thing i do want to mention for the most part throughout their career they were a trio so yeah. all this big sound they're creating just three guys right you know they they brought in an additional singer later on in their career who would share vocals with mark but for the most part it was just a trio here uh tomb of the serpent king butchers of the sea is the big like epic that opens up the album and i you know you know ryan mentioned it before that uh especially in the second half of their career a lot of big long eight nine ten twelve minute long tracks with just mountains of riffs and loads of solos and uh you know different vocal styles and this one is no exception great lead guitar uh frost and fire to me is like the thrash song on this album uh blood eagle crushes oh i love so that heavy. song ah oh, right Probably heavy ah oh. The title track is, if you like progressive metal, that's progressive metal right there. Really mm -hmm. complex, a lot of great riffs. Uh, not a bad song on this one either. And again, nope. that lo-fi production, which I think you basically get throughout all of their albums. There's yeah. nothing here that's squeaky clean. So if you don't mind that kind of really underground sound, uh, that's what you get here. And that it really suits them. Right? Like I can't imagine these guys having like a big... Iron Maiden style production or Judas Priest or something that you know sound it, it's just it's not these guys no it never has been no no it sounds good there's good balance That's... everything is like you know you can hear the drums the bass the guitar everything's well mixed it's just it's not really like that million dollar you know studio job you know definitely yeah. really get that homegrown feel to it yeah, this is not if you're like testing out a brand new audio setup and you want to impress your friends. You may not want to put on one of these CDs because it's like, you know, it's going to sound great, right? Based on the, the content itself, but it's not going to give you all those like dynamics you want in like a Sterling production. But again, that's the charm of these albums, I think. I love it. Yeah. All right, so coming in at number eight, uh, I have, I don't have the original of this, and this is might be the only album that doesn't have full artwork, but this is their... Uh, second or third which i'll get to in a second album and it's just called metal uh so this actually was a reissue and it has artwork that is a combination of their first album invasion and their second album metal and it's really cool you know the sword going through there so the deal with these guys was the first album is called invasion and i think that was like 79 or 80 and it's very 70s very psychedelic like you said very hawkwind inspired and then they, rec they recorded a second album called mark of the beast which is hard to get now yeah. uh and also very, very 70s, perhaps one of the more experimental things they ever did is really very long, you know, the most Hawkwind-esque stuff they ever did. You know, some of this stuff could like almost fit on Space Ritual. It's just like that kind of feel. But they decided to scrap that album. It came out years later, you know, in the 2000s. And they instead recorded an album called Metal, which is still kind of in that 70s vein. But now you can really hear them ramping up into like that 80s, like more hard-heading, like epic metal sound, you know, more of the man of war omen like that kind of stuff you know the conan and barbarian feel so uh this album's very cool uh it's not as good as the stuff that would come later which is why it's getting kind of lower in my list but uh the song cage of mirrors is one of the best tracks they ever recorded just absolutely fucking phenomenal and uh yep the artwork i, I actually like this one because it's nice it has good color to it and it looks really cool so for that one uh number eight is the album metal there you go that's a good one all right, my number eight, uh, Ryan already mentioned, Gates of Fire. 
Uh, pretty ingenious album here. I like the fact that they decided to split into three parts. It's like a three-part trilogy of unrelated stories, but yet sort of thematically similar. A uh, lot of really bombastic, epic, heavy tracks on here, which I absolutely love. Uh, you mentioned Riddle of Steel. Totally love that. I love how in that track, he goes from like this kind of like, um, you know, his normal vocal style. And then he does like um, this almost like death metal growl. And then he goes into this like King Diamond falsetto, mm -hmm. which is really good. He does that from time to time, right? And yeah. uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, when Giants Fall is great. Fall of Ilium is like 15 minutes really intense progressive metal uh rome is awesome kind of me uh, stand of the spartans just glorious riffing i mean uh, uh betrayal epitaph i mean just some great stuff on here this is uh I, it almost pained me to put this one so low because i really dig this one quite a bit but it's it supposed to show you the the strength of their catalog right all right so coming to number seven another new one this is uh 2002 so I guess I am really kind of heavy on these new albums at the point. Uh, yeah. So 2002 to be new, but uh, this is Spiral Castle. Again, cool artwork, cool fantasy artwork. Uh, you know, you get the barbarian there, the castle, the rainbow, very cool stuff. And uh, this was the second album they did after taking the nineties off. And the first one was called Atlantis Rising, which was very good. But this one I like, this is one of my favorite newer albums. Uh, some of their most intense, dissonant, like darkest and heaviest songwriting. Like you mentioned before, they throw in some death metal vocals here and there, which it kind of fits. It's not like, you know, they go straight into like Morbid Angel, nothing like that. You know, it's just like little accents on the vocals to kind of give the songs a little more, you know, oomph in the moment. And uh, Mark Soloing on this is, you know, it's incredible. The guys, I, they, I should also add at this point too, I was able to see them about 10 times live, unfortunately, before Mark passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, they always played uh, small venues. Like I saw them at uh, St. Vitus in Brooklyn, capacity of like maybe 200. I saw them in a little club in New Jersey called uh, Dingbats. Again, it's like a little bar, uh, always tiny little places. And they always kicked a million tons of ass. Like they played like they were playing to like Wackenfest in Germany. You know, they got up there and they just slayed ass for the whole time. 90 minutes set, no fucking around, total intensity. You know, they played like their lives depended on it. Every single time I saw them, like, I've said this to other people. I'll say it here too. When it comes to like my favorite classic metal live bands, my number one will always be Iron Maiden. But my number two, every time I've seen them, I'm going to say it's probably Manila Road. Just the sheer, I, I love the material, but the sheer intensity they play live. It was just like, you're watching them like, just like you're, you're like, ah, you know, just big shit eating grin on your face because they were so good. And they stayed that good, you know, right up through uh, different, you know, different lineups over their career. And uh, actually the guy they ended with on vocals, his name was Brian Patrick. Nickname was Hell Roadie because he was their roadie all throughout the 80s. And then he kind of got it actually in the band and became their vocalist. So they ended up as a quartet with uh, Brian as the vocalist. And he was great. He would sing all Mark's, like a lot of Mark's parts in the early days. And because uh, Mark was able to step back a little more and focus on the guitar playing and didn't lose his step, you know, just as amazing as ever. So that one going with Spiral Castle from 2002. Cool. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, and I think, you know, I, I never got to meet or talk to Mark, but I've read a lot about him. And uh, I heard he is like, he was one of the nicest guys and just lived and breathed heavy metal. He believed in the music so much. And I think it kind of came through in the music. You know, so, the last uh, time I saw him, it was uh, right before, you know, me and my friend Craig went down, we saw him in Dingbats. And I'm, I'm never one to meet band members. I'm just not that guy, you know. I, I won't go out of my way. But as we're leaving Dingbats, we walk around just a little bar walk around the side, walk into my car, and he's just hanging out on the side of the building, like, hey, Mark, we enjoyed the show. You're fucking great. Can we get a picture with you? And he's like, yeah, very friendly. He's like, yeah, come on, guys. So we got a picture, and I'm really glad I did because, you know, he passed away a couple months later, and that would be the last time we ever saw them, personally, last time I saw them. So just like that, just glad that moment happened, you know, by sheer chance. Yeah, it's a good lasting memory, right? Yeah. It is. So my number seven, uh, you actually mentioned just before, is Atlantis Rising from 2001. Another really cool cover. Uh, again, you know, really good artwork on these albums. Uh, I had a hard time picking between this one and the one you just mentioned because they're, again, well, so strong, right? Um, great title track on here. Uh, the riffs and the drums on this album, just really good. Uh, I love the doomy feel and bits of prog on uh, Megalodon which is another great track. 
Uh, sea Witch is good. March of the Gods just absolutely pulverizes. Um, again, I love these song titles. I mean, just absolutely great. Uh, then you got the, yeah. the like one two punch at the end of the album, which is uh, the Siege of it at Atlan and War of the Gods. Oh, I mean, what a way to end an album, right? <laughs> it is. That was, that was the album they came back on, too. And that kind of metal wasn't really, you know, in vogue back in like 2001. And they just no. came in, kicked it, you know, kicked ass, knocked it right out of the park with that. Yeah. This is like, okay, corn and everybody else, take that, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So my number six choice, going back to the 80s. Uh, and this is 1988. It's Out of the Abyss. Another cool, cool artwork here. So this is the thrashiest album they ever did because they, as we'll talk about in a minute, they got thrashier and thrashier throughout the 80s. They, were, they never were a thrash metal band, like pull out, like kind of like, you know, Dark Angel, but they headed that way. And uh, this one, it kind of tapered off some of their progressive tendencies and some of the more epic tendencies. So they didn't lose it, but there was definitely a much bigger focus on this on just like balls out thrash. And the first song is called Whitechapel, which is my favorite song. Oh, yeah. So obviously about uh, Jack the Ripper, you know, Whitechapel and Metal <laughs> use that name and it's just like seven plus minutes of just non-stop like like that is like the most like exodus dark angel kind of track like doesn't hold up doesn't you know hold back at all there's no epic qualities to it it's just pure blazing thrash metal yeah uh, and of course midnight meat train great song that clive barker story uh return of the old ones is a great song a little slower you know so it's not all balls out thrash and uh yeah good album good album a little uh compared this is like you know some of my favorite bands, they have that clutch of like albums, like can't think of perfect albums. So you pick like four or five four in a row. So then after those couple of perfect albums, you're like, well, they did another one that wasn't as good, but still good. So this is that album for me. This is the uh, the eight out of 10, as opposed to the nine or 10 out of 10, like set of previous 80s albums, but still very, very good. Definitely the fastest shit they ever did. So uh shows that they were good as a thrash band is, you know, started as a psychedelic Hawkwind kind of band became like a progressive like epic heavy metal band and when they took their uh, you know tried their hand at thrash they were pretty damn good at that too so uh out of the abyss from 1988 keep it out because that's my number six as well um yeah i definitely i agree with everything you said it's definitely their thrashiest album uh i like how and you know if you're, if you're paying attention to a lot of the song titles we're mentioning you know mark was big into you know horror films and gothic uh, novels and, you know, literature and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you get a lot of uh, the ideas for a lot of the songs for a lot of these albums. That's where they came from. But yeah, uh, Black Cauldron, title track. Again, you hear some of those King Diamond falsettos on this album, which is pretty cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Return of the Old Ones, I think you mentioned, Whitechapel, yeah. Midnight Meat Train. I mean, Rites of Blood, which has Excellent. some killer guitar solos on it. So. Yeah, that is uh, that's actually one that I do not have like a, a CD of that I need to get. I've always mm -hmm. dug it. It's like, you know, I did it's this is like the catalog is so big and I thought I had most of them. And that's like, you know, you look on the shelf and you're like, oh, I still am missing a couple of these, you know, but. Uh, Fortunately for because uh, I guess this is a good time as any to mention one of the good things that benefited this band was in the 80s. Like they put out all these albums and they were all in these tiny little labels and nobody could get them. I know in another show, uh, one of your guests was talking about it was like a regional thing, you know. You lived in the midwest you could probably find these albums but you know if you were in europe or new york or like anywhere else good luck you know yeah. and once you knew that one little record store that was like you know i know you know i can get them in you know good luck finding this stuff but this is one of the bands that has benefited from the internet because people put stuff up on youtube you know obviously legal downloading but it enabled younger people to hear these albums and be like this band's fucking great you know how do i get this stuff well for a while you couldn't but then you know the demand was there so record labels like shadow kingdom and uh I don't know if it was High Roller, but so, you know, a couple small indie metal labels stepped in and they reissued all this stuff. So now, uh, other than the Mark of the Beast album, which was the lost one that they reissued later on, which you can get, but you got to pay a little money for it. Uh, every other album they ever did, uh, you can probably find on CD Mint Condition for under 20 bucks. Which yeah. uh, For some bands like this, that's not always easy. You know, they always have those couple albums. You know, I know when I was collecting Uriah Heap albums years ago, I had to buy all these like Russian pressings because like some of the later 70s, early 80s albums like Abominog you can still get. But some of them are like nobody gave a fuck. So you try to find a copy now. It's like, ah, eh, it hasn't been reissued because the demand's not there. So good luck finding it 35 years later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the Internet really helped these guys out, which is great because. Uh, oh, so my next album. All right. Number five. 
is my favorite of their newer albums. And you already mentioned it, and that is Voyager. And I agree with everything you said about it. It's got that great crunchy lo-fi sound, uh, these great epic songs, old Viking based, uh, Frost and Fire was my favorite of the batch, but just a really good, powerful, like representational, like where they are, where they were in the modern era, you know, these, you know, almost like just kind of like catering to the fans. Cause you can't just pick this up and be like, you know, dive into it if you're totally unfamiliar. It's kind of like, eh, imposing for that reason. But, you know, if someone is a long time fan, love it. Great drumming too. Uh, yeah, Corey Krishner, absolutely amazing drummer back then when they were doing this stuff. So this was from uh, 2008. Yeah, so a little over a decade old now, but awesome album. Good stuff. All right, well, so we're in the top five. So this this was the toughest part of this list for me because uh, I really like these five a lot. And uh, I just I just kept shuffling these around. And originally my number five was actually quite a bit higher. And, uh, but as I was kind of re-listening to all these again, I'm like, oh man, it's like, I think I had this perception in my mind going back like maybe five years ago because this was one of the first ones I ever got from them. And I, you know, sometimes the first album you hear from a band tends to stick with you, right? In many cases. Sure. But as I started listening to some of these other ones that I knew I really loved a lot, I was like, you know what? I don't think I like this one quite as much as a couple of these others. So it moved down to number five, but it's still one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, 1983's Crystal Logic. I think, you know, you talk to most people about this band and they cite this as either their favorite or their second favorite, right? So here you go. Got the vinyl uh, on display. Yeah. Great cover art, right? Uh, you know, here, again, like with a lot of the earlier catalog, the albums have more songs. They're not quite as big and epic, but uh, a lot of good mix of styles. You got Necropolis, which is pretty catchy for them. Uh, mm -hmm. Flaming Metal System, Heavy as All Hell, the thrashing Thanks. title track. The Riddle Master, great song, right? Mm -hmm. um, Ram, The Ram is a great song. Uh, you know, I think for me, the lo-fi production you notice a lot on this album for me like i think uh, compared to some of the other albums like this if this album had a little bit more money tied into the production woof you've got a absolute killer album right here it's killer anyway uh but i think the songs are great they hold up really well uh i just you know in revisiting this catalog again recently i just like you know what i think i love this but i think i like four a little four more a little bit better so, mm -hmm. But you know what? This is one of those lists that if we were to do this again in a month from now, change it'd be all different, right? Absolutely. So, uh, all right. So my number four. So these albums, these I could I could this like throwing darts at the board because these four are uh, being one of my favorite bands. This is that clutch of perfect albums. You know, Iron Maiden. You have you know first couple albums. You know, I'm a big Voivod fan. First same thing. First couple albums. You could just you know wake. It depends on what side of the bed you wake up on. Depends what your favorite album is. So. Round number four, I did 1986's The Deluge. Now, this has got some amazing, amazing art. I should have dragged the vinyl out for this, but <laughs> yeah. I just grabbed all the CDs. So uh, this this is uh, when they were in their, it's like the perfect mid period for them between thrashy stuff and more epic stuff. And they, the original drummer, or one of their older drummers, Rick Fisher, was no longer in the band. They got this guy called Randy Fox. And yeah, he kind of subscribed a little more to the uh, Keith Moon style of drumming, where he played the shit out of those drums. And a lot of bands in the style, like they don't have that very busy, like, you know, just constantly doing rolls and all kinds of little, you know, tricks and, you know, a little adding a little, you know, color. A lot of those guys just kind of did a more like basic drum beat or, you know, maybe a little double bass here or whatever. But this guy was just nonstop, just constantly fucking rolling and doing all kinds of crazy shit. Uh, if you know the much more even obscure U.S. Uh, epic band from the 80s called Brokus Helm, very obscure. Uh, they had two albums in the early 80s, and it was the same thing. The drummer was just a powerhouse, just absolutely just destroying the kit nonstop, almost irregardless of what the band were doing. So uh, this one, it's uh, really, really good songs. Uh, they, this is a clutch of albums where even to the end of their career, they played a lot of this stuff live. So there's uh, one song on here called Divine Victim. Every single time I saw it, they played it. Great sing-along, you know, parts. And that's what these guys are really good at in the 80s. Like These songs were like, you know, you get the crowd... It's like seeing Made in Her Man of War in that respect. Like everybody knew every word just because the songs, like even though they were a little bit complex and progressive, were very straight ahead and catchy in the same manner, which is a kind of, you know, it's a, like walking on the razor's edge to like achieve that balance. And they were really good at it. So uh, yeah, this one too. Also, uh, you know, Shadow, Shadow and Black, Dementia, the opening track, Hammer of the Witches, just incredible. Mark's vocals on this kick-ass, 
you know, amazing guitar riff solos. So this is a really, really good album. So I'm going with the Deluge, 1986. More about that in a couple minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go uh, one back from you. Uh, 1985's Open the Gates. Yes. I mean, look at that, huh? Love yeah. that artwork. Love that artwork. Oh, man, this is great. Uh, you know, they. Uh, this is also another one of those bands that have a had a really good habit of putting kick-ass songs at number one to open the album up. And yeah. Metal Storm is what kind of gets you in the groove on this album. <coughs> Oof, great stuff. And it's followed up by the title track. And then you got uh, The Fires of Mars, which is just absolutely awesome. Uh, uh, so many good songs. Road of Kings, Astronomica, again, big heavy riffs, shredding solos, uh, you know, those vocals, which by now I think, you know, this is where I think he's starting to feel comfortable in that role as yeah. the singer of the band, right? So, you know, it's, they're pretty damn serviceable, I think, and they fit the music. But uh, yeah, this is, a, a, you know, and the, and the epicness of the band is starting to come out a little bit here, but just a crushing, crushing metal, man, riffs that never stop, just mm. never stop. And a really unique sound. Like they they don't sound like anybody else at all. Nobody. Yeah. Like I've I've compared them to like, you know, Sierra Thungle, Brokus Helm, oh, when I mentioned all those bands, Lee Manowar. They don't sound like those bands. They're just like in the same general universe of like, wow. Right. You know, and you notice yeah. all those bands you mentioned don't sound like anybody else. And all yeah. and none of these sound like each other, but I think what they have in common is their uniqueness, right? That's true. Yep. There were all these American heavy metal bands back then. No one sounded like them. They had a, you know, propensity for like epic, like Robert E. Howard kind of like, you know, swords and sorcery lyrics and stuff, you know, yeah. Edgar Allan Poe lyrics. And uh, so on that, 1987, this is the fourth perfect album in a row. So this kind of capped off that, that era for them. And this is Mystification. And this had two uh, album artworks and the CD yeah. just happens to be good and it included both. Uh, yeah. And Mystification was, uh, so this, was kind of even more thrash than the Deluge, you know, because uh, from Crystal Logic, you know, they were from their start, they kind of progressively got a little faster, thrashier and heavier. Obviously, after this was out of the abyss, which was like full on thrash. But this one like threads that needle perfectly. Uh, some songs like Up From The Crypt. Uh, what else we got on this one? You know, Children of the Night, Haunted Palace, Spirits mm -hmm. of the Dead. They still played a lot of this. Like, I'd say on some shows I've heard, I've heard like maybe three or four of these tracks live, you know. Uh, so they pulled a lot of this stuff out on their later live shows. And this stuff is just fast, aggressive, thrashing, but still epic metal. You know, they walk that, that line perfectly here. Uh, great solos. Mark's vocals were even more comfortable. He really, like, was in that niche. But this is just an amazing, amazing album. So, you know, I don't even know what else to say about it other than, you know, check it out. But uh, I'd like to pick one song, the opening track. Like you said, they really were good about picking immensely good opening tracks. Up from the Crypt. Boom, kicked ass, right? Like 100 miles an hour right out of the gate. You know, no, uh, no taking prisoners there. So we're going with 1987, Mystification. Great choice. More about that in a minute. But before we get to that, uh, Courts of Chaos. Court of Chaos. Um, I told you we'd be talking about this again. I, I'd love this. Love the album cover on this. Awesome. Um, cool. Good, complex album heavy album and i think uh you know continued that line of all these 80s albums right and here they are moving into the 90s and uh doesn't sound much different uh here again i think you mentioned it before starting to get into that longer you know songwriting uh you know the books of skelos obviously is you know one of the the massive tunes on here that's just monstrous and heavy i love it uh touch of madness the prophecy kicks ass um, dig me no grave and you know the road to chaos which kicks off the album it's instrumental pretty damn cool uh and you know they do a really cool cover of blood rocks doa which is like you know i mean why you know how cool is it that this kind of like obscure metal band covering an obscure 70s hard rock band right yeah i've never heard anybody else cover blood rock too yeah. so. <laughs> and it's like one of those things they're obscure enough i've never heard of i actually never but it's very, very rare to hear somebody cover Manila Road, you know. I've heard it done, you know, some bands I'm friends with and some bands I know, but it's definitely a niche thing, you know. It's not a widespread thing. That album, that is a great album. Even though I put it at number 10, I still love it. Yeah, it's really good. And this this was actually much lower in my list earlier on. And then the more I kind of re-listened to it, I'm like, oh, man, I really dig this album a lot. And uh, it just kept creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. And I was actually surprised 
when I made the decision to rank it above Open the Gates and Crystal Logic, which originally I did not think was going to happen. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just it's a really, really great mid period album from them that I love quite a bit. All right. So my number two, oh, man, it's one of my favorite albums of all time. 1984, Open the Gates. Yep. One of the cool things about this artwork is right in the corner here, you got this little guy. Uh, yeah. What's going on with that? It's like a little skull spider and web with these big fangs. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this is just one of their amazing uh, fantasy artworks, of which they had so many. And this this is the first album where they had Randy Fox on drums. He replaced uh, Rick Fisher. So the drum drumming immediately took a step up in terms of like intensity and like speed, you know. So instead of just kind of like simple rock drumming, this guy was just all over the map. Like I said, we more of like a aggressive, like Keith Moon style, you know, like really just like pushing the whole time. Uh, if I had to pick a favorite song for a gun to my head, I'd probably say Road of Kings, which is a very like epic, empowering, fist in the air, sing along. They played it every single time I saw them. The place went fucking nuts. It was just like just that kind of song. But yeah, every, every track on this album, like you could just throw a dart at the board, you know, Open the Gates, Astronomica, Weavers of the Web, The Ninth Wave, Heavy Metal to the World, the Fires of Mars, Hour of the Dragon. Like there's, it's just one of those albums where there, there are no bad songs. You know, it's one of those rare albums, just... You know, people say are perfect albums, but how many albums are really like every song is as good as the next? For me, this is one of them, definitely. So 1984, Open the Gates, amazing, amazing album. Absolutely love it. Cool. Great choice. Uh, my number two, uh, obviously, we know the two that are left, right? I think pretty much everybody has uh, kind of figured it out. Uh, Mystification from 87, which uh, Ryan just talked about. Yeah, this is great. Um uh, yeah, you know, you could easily say this could be the number one, right? I mean, it's just so good. It is uh, so good. Up from the crypt. I mean, it's almost like they were like, all right, we're going to dial in some Slayer-like intensity, you know, circa rain and blood, because that song just like rampages. Man, you got uh, uh, so good. Children of the Night follows that. You Haunted Palace, you mentioned Spirits of the Dead. Title track is really haunting and like, you know, moody, which I love. Uh, I mean, could this be their heaviest album of the early period? I think it pretty much it could, up probably there. could be yeah like out of the abyss is probably a little faster but yeah. that has that speed plus that like epic kind of feel so it's yeah it really could be and the guitar tone on that is just monstrous too like yeah uh, mark sounds fucking amazing on it out because solos not it's just absolutely shreddy non uh, craziness you know doesn't yeah. ever hold back yeah great stuff so that's my number two i think i know what your number one is my number one is uh is one of my Top 10 favorite albums. This is a Desert Island album, folks. Uh, I love this album. Uh, like, this is the first album I heard by them. Uh, I heard it when I was pretty young. So I was already getting into, you know, I was big, big Iron Maiden is my favorite band of all time. So I was already huge into Maiden, big in the Priest, Sabbath. Uh, but I hadn't heard a lot of American heavy metal because that stuff's always been a little more obscure. You know, if you're really into this stuff, you can name a ton of bands. All the bands we mentioned, uh, bands like Jag Panzers and other, you know, so like they're, they're definitely out there and some of them are really good and famous, but you have to kind of know them. So one that broke the whole, you know, first one I ever really heard was 1983, Crystal Fucking Logic. Uh, this album is just, it, it's, it's, it's pretty lo-fi. Like you said, the production was, it would, would never get great in like a, in a professional studio sense. But on this album, it is pretty buzzy. The yeah. guitar is pretty buzzy. The bass has that kind of like, uh, you know, a little blown out sound. And uh, I, I love it. I, it's just, I wouldn't change a thing. I love it so much. Every song on this is perfect. Acropolis, the uh, first proper track. They would close every song with so that was their uh you know that was their you know they never they weren't a band to do uh encores they just would play to the end like oh, that's all. have a good night folks but they would always close every set with necropolis and the crowd would just like explode it's like a little three minute track uh it's definitely you know very catchy to the point you know if you can hear one manila road song but like this is what they're all about you know i'd always say that's like the best track to go to but you know the crop uh, the title track uh, Flaming Metal System, which was a bonus track on some versions of the album. Uh, Feeling Free Again, The Riddle Master, The Ram, Feels a Negative Existence, Dreams of Escaton, uh, just amazing. So I'd probably put this as uh, my favorite traditional metal album from the United States of all time is probably going to be this guy right here. So 1980, in the artwork too, it's that kind of yeah. like, you know, paperback, you know, that pulp paperback fantasy book, you know, you got a bunch of guys on the horseback overlooking this uh, cool, city with these green pyramids crystal pyramids so just a great fucking album of course they had it on the back their classic like uh there was never named it wasn't like an eddie or a vic rattle at megadeth i don't think this guy ever got a name but this uh demon was on uh, a lot of their uh 
I made its way into a lot of their merch, a lot of their artworks, obviously. Got it on a shirt here, too, from the last time I saw them at uh, that Ding Bat show in Jersey. So my number one is going to be Crystal Fucking Logic. I love them. As soon as we're done with the show, I'm going to put that album on. There you go, <laughs> as you should. All right, my number one, uh, I'm sure people have guessed by now, it, uh, 1986 is The Deluge. Uh, man, I, you know, as much as like Ryan, uh, and, well, I do too, I love Crystal Logic, but I think this is the one for me. As hard as my top five are to separate, um, this is kind of the one that always rises just a little bit above everything else for me. I mean, right Shadow out. in the Black, um, man hammer the witches isle of the dead taken by storm i love the big epic moody title track um which has some great great guitar solos the uh i mean just i'm looking at the, the track list everything on here is so good divine victim it's the riffs kill uh production's not too bad on this album you know again oh, by their that sounds good yeah by their standards the vocals are great love the love the artwork Love the feel of it all. It's big, it's epic, it's bombastic, it's heavy. Um, and his guitar playing is just so good. So good. You know, he's one of those guys, like one of those undiscovered, like he guitar is. virtuosos, you know? He is. I think, I think maybe because his vocals were kind of like polarizing early on, the people might have focused on that. I think he's a good vocalist. It's very fitting for the music. I think maybe that drew people's attention and it kind of like, you know, overlooked the fact that this guy's a really, really goddamn good guitarist, you know? between riffs, writing riffs, rhythm guitar, lead guitar, you know, like tasteful leads, but like very, you know, technically inclined leads too, you know, not just like mindless, like shredding, you know, you could really put together a good solo, kind of like a classic, like Tony Iommi fashion where, you know, yeah. you can play it in your head while he's doing it, you know, while you're listening to it, it sticks with you in that kind of way, so. Yeah, it's yeah. a good comparison and, and definitely the riffs are catchy in that way, like Iommi's too, yeah. It's true, yeah. But for folks watching, uh, you know, I'm sure we're going to get some people who have never listened to this band before. And, you know, we generally get the question, well, I want to go check out some of their stuff. Which are the best albums to try? It's like, well, like we just said, I think if you go and check out any of our top five. Safe bet. Yeah, that's pretty safe right there. You know, you really can't go wrong with Open the Gates, Mystification, The Deluge, and uh, Crystal Logic. I think that's probably the the four core right how you would yeah, say. I'd say they were one of those bands where you just they don't have that obvious like oh that's the album you know they have this group of albums and even the ones before and after were good but i'd say those four you could pick any of them out of a hat and you'd be uh as well served you know that's good stuff yeah and uh you know there is uh god i forget exactly how many albums in total was there it's just under 20 right yeah it's quite a few i had to uh we did the it's it's actually it is under 20 so we did the line share of them but yeah, there's quite a few more yeah uh, and they're all really good so you know you really can't go wrong with any of them but uh start with the, any of those first those four that we mentioned and i think that that's a pretty safe starting point point. and uh i think once you get into those you'll be like oh this is good and i will say uh not a lot of drop off on all the other ones so uh pretty cool. if you can get them for a good price you know however you buy your music uh, i think it'll you'll you'll uh it'll be money well spent yep it's a good band to dive into big discography lots of good music and it's stuff that it really unfolds over time. You know, it's not simple, like, oh, you hear it a couple of times, you know the songs. You know, you could spend years with this band and always find new stuff because they just had that, that depth and quality to their songwriting uh, consistently for decades. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there you have it, everybody. So uh, go check them out, right? Go check out some of these albums. Let us know in the comments what you think. If you are already a fan, uh, which I hope we do have some fans watching, uh, let us know what your favorite manila road albums are in the comments below ryan and i'll both be taking a look and seeing what you got and uh after you do that visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on twitter of course we're here on youtube all the damn time that's right so uh you can look for more of mr scout on monday night which is uh just a few days away with the hudson valley squares we've got a pretty cool show coming up on monday i haven't spilled the beans yet we're going to do it right now so the topic of monday is uh, we're going to revisit favorite albums of a specific year. I believe we picked 1982, correct? 1982, yep. 1982. So everybody on the on, in the squares is going to be talking about some of their favorite album releases from 1982, a pretty special year in music. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be live. So we'll be able to take some questions here and there and, uh, you know, talk about favorite albums from a really good year. So uh, stay tuned for that. And a lot more coming up on the channel. Um, 
IMP Pardo for Ryan Scow. We'll see you all real soon. Take care.